I'm live and the questions we didn't get to on air we're going to do now on Facebook Live. We actually have loads of questions but do keep them coming because we have a bit of extra time today to get through as many as we need to get to get through. So get the questions in. Even if it's late in the day we sometimes hold them off till next week. So keep the questions coming in. So let's jump over for the first question. Okay, so our first question is brokers or the bank, which is the best one to go about getting a mortgage with? So... Um, what I would say is, the question is brokers or bank, how, how, what's the best way of getting your mortgage? I would absolutely say brokers. And I'll tell you why. I, the, the mortgage market is incredibly intricate, detailed, there's nuances in it. If you're not doing mortgages all day, every day, I have no idea how you manage to get a mortgage approved. And if you do manage to get a mortgage approved by walking into a random bank and picking yourself, I think that's the best bank. I would suggest that you would probably have got approved by any of the banks because the ones that get approved, yeah, sometimes you can be really lucky and get someone in the bank who is um, really dedicated and pushes a case across the line and gets it done and that can work really well. But the fact that you got it done by yourself would suggest you would have got it done anywhere. And how do you know? It's that kind of FOMO thing. How do you know that you've actually picked the right one? Sometimes brokers charge fees. Sometimes brokers get paid commissions for introducing the mortgage to the banks. Sometimes they do both. That's okay. As long as it's transparent, that's okay. The other thing is, is if at the last minute, say you go and you you know what, Owen, I have found the best mortgage on the market. This one suits me best. It's the cheapest rate. They're doing everything I want to do. And then the couple of weeks before you draw down, another bank comes in and undercuts them and it's cheaper. You're going to have to go through all that process again if you're dealing direct or else the mortgage broker photocopies your application and submits it into the other one and you get that cheaper rate. It's just one example of where the broker has a much better um, grasp on what's going on in the mortgage market. But I would say that. Okay, so somebody wants to know, should I pay off my mortgage bi-weekly or monthly? So should you pay off your mortgage bi-weekly or monthly? If your mortgage and most mortgages are, like 99% of mortgages, they will calculate the interest on a day-to-day basis or at the very least week-to-week basis. It used to be thing on a month-to-month basis. So they can calculate the interest based on the outstanding balance on a day-to-day. That means if you're paying it off every second week, there will be a slight increase on the amount of money that you owe on interest. Because if they're calculating daily the interest amount, if the interest, if the remaining amount outstanding is the same for 30 days, obviously the interest cost is going to be more over 30 days, but if it comes down every two weeks, the interest cost is going to be slightly less. Now it is marginal. There was a thing a couple of years ago where people were told that if they paid it weekly, they could actually dramatically reduce their mortgage repayment or their their overall mortgage term. And that is correct. But the main reason why that's correct is because you actually pay 13 times a year instead of 12 times a year when you work a weekly payment out on a monthly. And that's because there are 4.33 weeks in every month. So if you pay weekly instead of monthly, you will end up making a full extra payment in a calendar year. And that's why your mortgage comes down really quickly. So yeah, the, the technical answer is there will be a marginal difference by paying your week your mortgage every second week. If, and if you pay it every second week, that's probably a good idea. Okay, so it's a bit of a long one. So I have a seven grand loan that I took out two years ago for college. The repayments are 212 per month. I'm currently saving 900 per month for the last six months. I find my low re- loan repayments are leaving me with very little to live off each month, but I won't reduce my savings as I'm going for a mortgage in the next three months and don't want to ruin my consistent savings. Is a loan restructure feasible for me from the bank in terms of reducing the monthly payments or will this hinder my chances in getting a mortgage? What I would say there, if you're thinking of restructuring the mortgage or restructuring the the personal debt before applying for the mortgage, I would actually apply for the mortgage and tell them that you've got these loans and ask them if you restructured it, what would they prefer to see you do? Realistically, you really need to consider how much damage the repayments are going to be on your ability to borrow. Because... If you have, the the way the banks work, there's a couple of different ways that they calculate how much you can borrow, but let's just keep it really simple with one of the things that they do. If your take-home pay is €1,000 a month, so that means after tax and everything, when you get paid, you end up with €1,000 in your pocket. The bank looks at that and says, you can afford to use 35% of that, roughly 35% of that, so €350, can be used to service debt. So that's all loans. So if you would imagine in your situation, it was one of the loans was 212 euros. Now the bank only has 138 euros. The difference between the 350 and the 212, they have 138 euros to service their mortgage. 
and they work backwards in the day and say, right, 138 euros, 25 or 30 year term, this is the interest rate, this is the mortgage you can borrow. So in that case, that 212 euro loan repayment, if your take home pay was 1,000 and the 35% was 350, that 212 euros loan repayments, even though there's only seven grand, would more than have the amount of mortgage that you could afford to borrow from the bank. So it's a very simplistic approach to take to it. I know the numbers would never work out like that. But my point is, I have had situations. In fact, in one of the TV shows I was involved with a couple of years ago, there was a guy who had 8,000 euros left on a car loan and his ability to borrow was halved as a result of that 8,000 euros car loan, which is not far off the figures we're talking about with you. So what I would say is, is, approach a broker actually and they will be able to work at the numbers and say to you okay this is the best way to do it refinancing or restructuring the loan is one way of doing it or i'm sorry but i'd much prefer to see you clear that debt before um, you actually apply not apply for the mortgage but before you draw down the mortgage that's another t- key thing to take into account if you've got enough savings to clear off the debt don't necessarily clear the debt before applying for the mortgage apply for the mortgage and tell them that you're willing to clear the personal debt before you draw down the check but then you still have to have enough money to have a deposit after that. So it's a tough one, but I'm afraid you're going to have to go backwards to go forwards on that one. Okay, so I'm a bit sceptical of brokers at the moment. I am somewhat doing business with one who's full steam ahead for me, going with permanent TSB for my mortgage and told me that I do not qualify for bank of, with Bank of Ireland criteria. Uh, we need an exception. But another broker has told me that I do meet the criteria for a Bank of Ireland exception. Why is their advice conflicting? So an exception in this, what an exception means just for people who don't know what a mortgage exception is, is there are central bank rules and the central bank tell all the banks that this is the rules that you have to apply when giving out mortgages. So there are things like no more than 90% of the value of the of the property can be given in the mortgage, the, the, the customer has to come up with 10%, no more than three and a half times your salary can be given out. And sometimes the bank, central banks say, yeah, they're the rules, but you can break those rules in exceptional circumstances. And the exceptions, there's a limit to the amount of exceptions any bank has. What could be happening there, and this is really interesting, and I'm not sure it's something that the banks realised was going to happen, but the exceptions are, like, let's say, 20% of all the loans you do this year can be an exception. Let's just take that as the number. 20% of all the loans you do. The the banks man- so micromanage it that if you are one bank, bank branch on the main street in a tie, and you've used up your 20% already this year, well, then you're not getting any more. Whereas the exact same type bank, this exact same bank in a different branch may not have used up their 20% already this year and therefore could give you an exception. I'm not saying that's what's happening in your case, but I just question, and what I would do is I'd go back to your broker and say, you mentioned Bank of Ireland was the one that they told you you couldn't have an exception with because you didn't meet the rules. Go back to them and ask them how many exceptions have they had? Have they used up all their exceptions? And ask them to confirm that in writing to you just by email. It's probably easier to send an email to them and asking them, can you confirm if you've used up all your exceptions or what percentage of your book this year have you done exceptions with with Bank of Ireland? I, I wonder, is that the case? That's assuming, of course, that the other broker has it right and can definitely get you an exception. So there could be something to do with that just locally at that broker's level, they've used up all their exceptions already for that particular bank. But who knows? I would question if there isn't trust there with your advisor, with your broker, I'd worry about the long term relationship there. Um, and I just wonder, you'd certainly need to have a conversation with this broker. I know if they put a lot of work into it, just be careful about taking it away from them without just cause. But you do need to be able to trust the broker you're dealing with. Okay, so this comes in from Helen. So I was offered a new job and I don't want my boss at present to know. Can I ask him for voluntary voluntary redundancy? And just as an FYI, there's only two of us in the office. Okay, so you've been offered a job. The question I'd ask is, is the potential for voluntary redundancies? Like, it's not something that generally an employee would come and say, any chance of it. And one of the things is, is that if you're definitely leaving anyway, there's no harm in having a conversation around what's the future here. I'm a bit concerned about my future. And if things aren't going well, if things are going well, like there are rules and regulations about when redundancy can be offered and when they can't. So they can't exactly create it for you. Um, but you do have to accept. And as an employer myself, one of the things I'd say is is that if someone walks in the door looking for voluntary redundancy, I'd question how committed they are to working with me anyway. And therefore, what I would say to you is, is you have to be ready to walk before you have any type of conversation um, like that. Um, and you've got a job in the bag. Sounds like you're going to take it anyway. And you're maybe looking to get a 
few quid if that's okay um, in terms of getting some type of severance package when you leave. But that would depend on the climate of the business itself and if it's doing well or not doing well. Um, have the conversation when you're absolutely ready to leave. Okay, so Francis wants to know, is it illegal to have foreign bank accounts? It's not illegal to have foreign bank accounts. It's probably illegal not to declare them. Um, so you'd question what it is. Like, you can have a bank account in the UK. You can have a bank account in abroad. Um, if you're trying to hide money in the bank account, it's a completely different question. Uh, yeah, you do need to... You're, like, all of us, in fact, are supposed to be doing a tax return. Whether you're a PAYE worker or not, you should be doing a tax return. And it would be declared on a, on a tax return that you have a bank account, a foreign bank account. And particularly if you have a foreign bank account, you would be better off doing a tax return on a year-to-year basis. People who do do tax returns, on average, there's, there's different numbers depending where you look, but on average we'll get somewhere between 800 and 1,200 euros in a tax refund. That's money that goes unclaimed by people who don't bother to do a tax return. People are afraid to do tax returns because they're worried they're going to end up paying more tax, but the majority of people who do tax returns get somewhere between 800 and 1,200 euros back off the tax man. Um, Would the Central Credit Register and the Irish Credit Bureau ratings be the same? I wanted to find out my credit rating, so I got the ICB, which has come back all clear. Do I still need to check with the CC or...? So the ICB is the one that's been around for years. The Central Credit Register is a newer one and it won't necessarily be the same because it has a much lower um, floor before they start re- registering things on the Central Credit Register. I think the, the minimum amount of the loan is anything above €500 Euros gets put on the Central Credit Register. It's a much more in-depth kind of look across all finances and you would definitely, like it doesn't cost you any money, it'll only take a couple of days, but you are definitely, if you're going to do your ICB report, go and get your um, Central Credit Register done as well. Um, actually, in episode one of How to Be Good About Money, one of my proudest moments was we did uh, we did mention ICB and Central Credit Register, and I believe they had trouble with their websites and the amount of people who logged on that night, which was a nice little thing, a good win for me. Um, so this person wants to know, any advice on how to get the best price for legal fees slash mortgage protection when drawing down your mortgage? So any best in, in terms of getting the best price on legal fees, you just need to shop around. It's 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 unfair to call it a commodity, but it is. It's something, it's a process that all solicitors who are involved in this type of work will be able to do. So you need to shop around. Coming back to the other one, the question a minute ago with the broker and the questioning over whether the broker was doing the right thing or not. Make sure the solicitor you pick, no different than a broker you pick or financial planner you pick, is someone that you get on with and someone that you have trust with. That's important and sometimes can be worth an extra few quid because it's an extremely stressful time when you're buying a house. It's very stressful. So you want somebody, like don't go with somebody cheap who you just have no time for because you're really going to regret that decision. But shop around, ring around a few different people and make sure that they're doing this work day in, day out. On the mortgage protection side, again, like this sounds like a an advertisement for a broker today, use a broker, get online, have a look around at the different people. Don't necessarily, some of the some of the online websites would say, here it is, this is the cheapest in the market and this is why you should come to us. There's a lot of work involved in deciding what the best type of life cover is for you. And I would also say, if you're thinking about life cover, some of the stats around it, the bank will require you to have life cover in most circumstances. In 99% of cases, they'll require, and it'll be a condition of your loan offer that you have life cover. They don't insist on you having specified illness cover. You are five times more likely to claim the specified illness cover than you are to claim the life cover during the term of your mortgage. It's more expensive, but what specified illness cover does is if you get one of the big things like cancer, heart attack or stroke would be 75% of the claims. They're the three big things. And there's a whole list of sometimes 50 other illnesses that if you get them, they pay out. The mortgage gets cleared off completely. And it is more expensive, but it makes a huge amount of sense. Don't discount. And the other thing not to do is, this is always happens. People say, oh no, the life cover is much cheaper. I'll do the life cover now and I'll come back to it in 12 months and I'll add the specified illness cover to it or I'll take out a new specified. You won't. If you don't do it at the time you take out of the mortgage, there is never a good time to increase the repayments on your mortgage protection. So I would say do it and do it at the start and get started with specified illness cover as well as the life cover. Five times more likely to claim it. Okay, so this is the last question we have time for. So it comes in from Quillon. So is a government housing bond safe? So a government housing bond, you've given a bond to, to the government for the secure, to secure your house, I assume. This is probably more of a legal question. It is certainly more of a legal question. 
I would go ask your solicitor or whoever it is that's advising you on the legal side on that one um, because it's a government bond at the end of the day. I'm not sure there are, some people would argue that the government is not the safest person in the world to give money to, but um, I would argue that it probably is, but it's more of a legal question, so I'm going to dodge that one. I'm happy to take another one if you want, um, seeing as I dodged that one completely like a good politician would. Yeah. So Harry is going to be the last one. So I worked in Ireland for six years before leaving for the US uh, from 1974 to 1980. Um, Would I still be eligible for a pension when I turn 65, even though I'm still living in the US? So if you only had six years of contributions, there is a real simple way of doing this. You can fill out a form with the social welfare um, here in Ireland and ask them to do a calculation for you. The the amount of pension you get is based on your average contributions over the term of your, your entire working life. And there were some changes made to that in recent years, but over your entire working life, your average credits per year is what works out how many um, how much of a pension you get. You might be entitled something to something quite minimal, but just get in touch on, on, on the website, on the social welfare website, you'll get a form that you just fill out. You need your old PRSI number, PPSN number as it is now, um, to be able to work out to, to, to fill out the form but it's certainly worth it because that can be extremely valuable if um, if you can find out what your record looks like and if you're entitled to anything possible but if it does happen I'm not sure how much money it is but it's definitely worth chasing it so that's it for Facebook Live for this week thanks very much for all the questions and um, we will be back next week and I'll be on air next week as well just beforehand thank you